His upper lip curled at the scent of urine. Hudson hefted himself to his feet, fumbled with the stool door, and bolted for the nearest sink. He stuck his head under the faucet and scrubbed at his face and hair with the hottest water he could stand. When he was done, he used a pile of paper towels to dry himself off as well as he could. Then Hudson looked back into the stool he'd just exited. He stared at it. What was wrong with it? Something wasn't right. Hudson took a step back. Then he took two steps forward. No, that wasn't possible. But it was. The toilet in the stool and the stool door were completely dry, and it smelled the way the rest of the bathroom smelled, like soap and disinfectant. If he just whipped his head out of a urine-filled toilet, water would be splashed all over, and the stool would, have, would still have that acidic, putrid uh, scent. How could the stool look suddenly pristine? Hudson couldn't make sense of this, and it made him angry. Think you've gotten me, don't you? Hudson shouted. He didn't know whom he was shouting at, and that made him even angrier. What do you want? He screamed, or to whom, or what he didn't know. No one and nothing answered. Hudson breathed heavily for several seconds, then he sighed. Okay, I give. He wasn't sure what it was going to accomplish to give him to his opponent. Who was his opponent? But maybe acting meek could buy him some time to figure out what was going on. Ha! <laughs> Acting meek. He wasn't acting at all. He wanted to surrender, wave the white flag and roll over on his back like a submissive puppy. He wasn't up for whatever kind of warfare he was in. He didn't understand it and he wasn't equipped for it. Speaking of which, he picked up the hammer. He didn't want to stay in the bathroom all night. He might as well head back to the office. He took a step. He stopped when he heard a chuckle. That was a chuckle, right? Yes, there was another one. Now he was being laughed at. Where was the laughter coming from? Sounded like it was coming from above him. Hudson looked up. Sure enough, there was the source of the laughter. The yellow-green rabbit's head was hanging out through the opening of the big vent high on the wall. Oh, God. Its mouth was open, and it was laughing its head off. Hudson roared and threw his hammer at the tooth-filled head. The head disappeared back into the vent. Hudson stared at the opening. He had to pursue, didn't he? First, if he didn't pursue, he'd know he was a coward. Second... How would he know where the rabbit went if he didn't follow it? If he didn't know where it was, he was in more danger. Before he could think about it, Hudson jumped up onto a toilet seat, climbed onto the pipes, then to the top of the stool door. He grabbed the lip of the vent and heaved himself up into the cavernous tube above the ceiling. Once there, he went rigid, expecting further attack. Nothing happened. He pulled out his flashlight, flipped it on, and shined it around. He was alone. He stopped and sat in the giant vent. What was he doing in here? This was crazy. Did he really want to go after the animatronic rabbit? Hutton straightened his shoulders. Yes. Yes, he did. He wasn't going to be a snivelling kid anymore. He was going to stand up to the bullies and his miserable stepdad. He was going to go rabbit hunting. Hutton giggled at his joke. Did his giggle sound a little demented to his own ears? Wasn't he uh, slipping in and out of his present and his past? For a second, he was a kid pretending he had the courage to go after the bullies who hurt him. But it was just a second. He knew where he was, and he knew he had to go on the offensive or he was going to lose his mind. Getting onto his hands and knees, Hudson put his flashlight in his mouth and crawled away from the opening to the men's restroom. Stopping every few feet to take the flashlight from his mouth and aim it at that this way and that, while he listened for sounds, he got about 20 feet before he encountered his first character head. Startled, he lifted his own head and bumped it on the metal above him. He scuttled backward and stared at the face looking back at him. It was Freddy Fazbear himself. Not really, it was a Freddy costume head. An old, nearly threadbare one. Or was that threadbare? <laughs> Funny. Uh, Hudson giggled again. And he had to admit, the giggle was too childish sounding. He needed to focus on the task at hand. Find the escaped rabbit. No, find the bullies. No, find the strange animatronic. He scooted forward to a vent corner. He peered around the corner and he spotted another head. Again, he jumped so violently he banged the top of his head against the metal above him. He forced himself to breathe calmly as he studied the head. It was Chica's, though her teeth were half gone and her bill was torn. 
Interesting. Interesting. This head was still attached to a part of Chica's body. The body had just a shoulder, an arm, and a hand. Yeah, this must be the um, logbook Chica, right? Is that what we're thinking? I don't know how that fits in, though. Hudson gave the thing a wide berth, watching it to be sure it wasn't going to suddenly grow feet and come after him. He didn't stop watching until he rounded a corner. Hudson didn't know how long he crawled through the vent system. He also didn't know how many heads he found. He lost track of both time and sensory input. Every stretch of the vent seemed like every other. Every turn was both familiar and unfamiliar. Several times he was sure he got a glimpse of yellow-green fur up ahead. Each time he stiffened and readied himself for an attack, but one never came. Twice, Hudson heard the scrabbling of little claws on the metal in the vent, and he spotted one of the rats. He dropped rat droppings too. Gross, Hudson said more than once when he put his palm on rat poop. Sometimes when he stopped moving, Hudson was sure he heard swishing sounds or tapping sounds or clinks or bumps from up ahead or behind him. Mostly though, he heard his own breathing, his own ragged, laboured breathing. Finally, his knees sore and his head throbbing and tingling, he decided he was never going to win a game of hide and seek in these vents and he had to get back to the office and rewrap his head. So he turned to crawl down a vent tunnel that went toward light. He wasn't sure where he was in the building. He'd gotten totally disoriented, but he was sure he had the leg strength to kick out a vent cover, and because the vent openings were so huge and the ceilings weren't unusually tall, he figured he could drop from the vent opening to the ground no matter where he came out. He began crawling ahead, but something grabbed his foot. Something grabbed his foot and held on. Swallowing a scream, Hudson turned and looked behind him. He fully expected to see nothing, because he kept seeing nothing when he turned to check sounds. But this time, something was there. Screaming, Hudson yanked his foot toward, the bod toward his body and sat up. Once again, he bashed the top of his head against the vent tunnel ceiling, but he didn't pause to care about it, because the thing hanging onto his foot was still hanging on. Get off! He screeched. Get off! He using his flashlight. He beat at the yellow arm that had a grip on his foot. It was Chica again. The Chica head attached to a shoulder, arm and hand. And the hand was hanging on to Hudson's foot as if his foot was the most important thing in the world. She just has a fetish. <laughs> Hudson shook his foot and pounded on the yellow hand that wouldn't let go. I like you. Oh God. Yeah, maybe it is a fetish. I like you, a woman's voice said. Not just any woman's voice, Faith's voice. Hutton froze. He shined his flashlight back and forth in the vent tunnel. Then he aimed the light at Chica's mouth. Had the voice come from Chica? I like you, the voice said again. The voice didn't sound like it was coming from the Chica head. Just as the Mr. Atkins voice had come from a void Hudson couldn't locate, so did this one. This voice, however, had a more immediate impact on Hudson. He felt it squeezing his heart, touching him the way it had when Faith said those very words to him on their, on their only date. I like you, Faith had said. It was the different I like you than the casual way she'd said the words at work before she basically told him to ask her out. In the restaurant, under the muted lights in the alcove, where the small table was tucked, Faith's eyes had looked so soft and sincere when she said it. And it wasn't just, I like you. What she actually said was, I like you a lot, Hudson. You're a nice guy. And then she reached across the table and touched his hand. His fingers were so smooth and warm. And when he turned his hand over and took hers in his, she didn't protest. She just smiled at him in a way no one had ever smiled at him before. It was the best moment of his life, unlike this one. Now Hudson wasn't in the restaurant with Faith. He was in the huge vent with a piece of an animatronic glond onto his foot. Aware of the pressure still grasping his foot, Hudson tried to lean forward and use his fingers to pry Chica's hand from his shoe. But that was a bad move, because Chica had shifted her grip. Now she was holding his right hand. Faith hung on to Hudson's hand when he walked her home. She smiled the whole time too. She listened to him, laughed at his jokes, and at one point she even put her head on his shoulder for a moment. A strand of her hair blew up against his neck. It felt so silky, and it smelled like berries. Hudson welcomed the warmth, the connection. He looked down at his hand, entwined with, it wasn't Faith's hand in his. No! Hudson screamed. He no longer felt touched, not emotionally anyway. 
Obviously, he was being touched, literally, by the other hand, and maybe he was being touched in the head too. Hudson swung his arm around, which in turn swung the Chica parts around. He battered them over and over against the vent tunnel sides. Chica was oblivious. She held on. He had to get out of here, doing his best to not think about the animatronic part attached to his right hand. Hudson crawled ahead, making for the vent cover he'd had his eye on. He knew if he could get out of the relatively confining vent space, he'd have more room to manoeuvre Chica off his hand. Ignoring Chica's continued expressions of determined love, Hudson crawled to within a couple feet of the vent cover, turned his body and kicked up the cover loose from the wall. Crawling forward, he shined his light down into the room below. He was backstage. Wow, he was totally turned around. He thought he was on the opposite side of the building. Turning again, Hudson exited the vent tunnel feet first, dropping to the floor and immediately swinging his arm in a wide arc to slam Chico against the floor. When her grip loosened, he flung her free and kicked her into a pile of costume parts on the far side of the dressing area. I like you, he heard again. And then he heard a sound he'd never heard before. It was a sound he could barely describe. It was a roar, he thought at first, and especially a shrill roar with distinctive separate tones that told him it was a combined roar, the combined roar of many Venny voices. It was also a breath, a great exhale and a groan all at once. What? Hudson began. The costume parts began to tear the Chica parts to bits, like a frothing, churning pool filled with fuzzy, colourful pin piranhas. I was going to say piñatas. Uh, the costume parts came to life, and in seconds, they pulled Chica apart and ripped her into a hundred pieces. He would have kissed Faith goodnight by her door after their date, but her roommate opened the door and walked with between them, just as he was making his move. Later, after Fa Faith asked, Faith, after Faith called to ask if he'd done it, he realised the roommate had opened the door and walked out deliberately to keep him from kissing Faith. That was probably the moment when it all began to come apart. As quickly as the attack on Chica began, it ended. The pile of costume parts was once again just a pile of parts. It didn't look any different than it had before. And now Hudson was looking at wisps of yellow fabric. Chica had been reduced to almost nothing, just like Hudson. Faith's rejection had torn from his heart and his hope into little bits. He looked at his hands. Was that yellow fuzz under his nails? Hudson wiped his hands on his pants several times, and once again Hudson was alone in the stillness, not liked, not capable of understanding what was going on. Hudson turned away from the yellow tufts of fur. He ran back toward the office. When he reached the end of the hall, however, he stopped. He looked down at his empty hands. He'd lost his nightstick. He'd lost his hammer. With the animatronic wandering somewhere in the building and with everything else going on, what was going on? He needed a new, a new weapon. He veered away from the office in the direction of the kitchen. When Faith and her team first designed it, the kitchen was only going to be a replica of one of the pizzeria kitchens, but then management decided they wanted this attraction to be available as a venue for parties. That's when the fake kitchen became a real kitchen. Over the last few days, Barry and Duane, uh, I keep saying Duane, Barry and Duane had been bringing in boxes of kitchen supplies. They were still stacked up next to the counters. Surely one of those boxes contained a knife or something that could be used as a weapon. Hudson reached the kitchen without anything else weird happening, and he found what he needed in the second box he opened. Continually, checking over his shoulder, Hudson armed himself with a butcher knife and a rolling pin. Feeling only a little ridiculous as he left the kitchen, he held both weapons ahead of him as he hurried back to his office. Twice along the way, he was sure he heard a clickety-click behind him, but when he checked both times, nothing was there. Finally reaching the office, Hudson looked around it thoroughly before closing and locking the door. Then, setting down his weapons, he tore off the wet wrap on his head. He used the reminder of his bandages to rewrap it because his head was still oozing. When he was done, he sat down in his chair. Hudson checked both the monitors and the blanket hanging over the vent cover. Nothing was amiss. What should he do next? Hudson looked up at the ceiling, then shook his head. The solution was so easy he couldn't believe he missed it. Stupid, Mr Atkins said from somewhere. Hudson groaned. He was being stupid. He didn't have to stay in this building and, he, and be abused all night. Just plain stupid, the Atkins voice said. 
Hutton stood. All he had to do was get out of the building. Why was he still in here? It wasn't like he was locked in. He had keys. He reached down and touched his key. He looked down. Where was, he key Where was his keys? Oh no. The belt loop on which he normally hooked his keys was torn. The keys were gone. He looked madly around the room, checked his pockets, looked at the monitors. No keys. Stupid, the Atkin voice reminded him. Hudson closed his eyes and hung his head. If he'd been gone, if he'd gone for his keys first, he would be out of here by now. He opened his eyes. Well, there was nothing he could do about that now, unless he could break out somehow. He was locked in. He couldn't call anyone either. He had no phone, and of course the building's phone system was coming in tomorrow. But why not break out? Surely he couldn't easily reach the few windows in the building. But couldn't he break the glass front doors? Maybe. Or he could just wait out the night in here. It was safe in here. Or at least he'd know if someone was or something was trying to get in. The second he had that thought, something thumped against the door, and the blanket over the vent rippled. The vent made a rending sound, and the vent cover fell down from behind the blanket to land with a clatter on the floor. As soon as the vent landed, animatronic mouths and costume mouths began falling through the opening. What's the square root of 144? Mr. Atkin asked. No, not Mr. Atkin. An animatronic mouth. Also, the answer is 12 or minus 12. <laughs> what? Hudson said. Wrong, stupid, Mr. Atkin said. It was Mr. Atkin in his algebra class. I mean, that's not really algebra. <laughs> but okay. Hudson could see the windows looking out at the school parking lot, the cars glistening in the rain. What's 4x plus 6? There we go, Mr. Atkin said. Work the problem. Uh, first of all, you, you, you can't really work that out unless you have a value for x. <laughs> or you would have to find the value of x if it was equal to something. That's just an expression. You can't really do anything with that. <laughs> uh, Hudson looked around. He wasn't in algebra class. He was in his office. Animatronic mouths surrounded him, firing algebra questions at him. Hudson held his head. Stupid. Another mouth said, using Mr. Atkins' voice. How do you find a value through the process of substitution? <laughs> okay, Mr. Atkins screamed through another animatronic mouth. As a mathematician, uh, yeah, these are, these are very basic questions. Um, Hudson shook his head and willed himself to see what was real and what wasn't. Stupid, a different mouth said. All the mouths sounded like Mr. Atkin. Stop it, Hudson shrieked. Stop it. All the mouths advanced on him. Stupid, 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 stupid. The assault came from inside and outside of his head, and it came from all around him, as the mouths fell endlessly from a vent opening and pressed toward him in a ghastly chorus of judgment. Hudson tried to get up and run, but the mouths were like marbles flung all over the floor. He lost his balance and fell. And then they overran him. Mouths crawled over him. They skittered up his legs, slithered through his hair, and hopped from one end of his body to the other. Hudson flailed and kicked. He shrieked some more. When a mouth tried to crawl inside his mouth, and another one began to burrow into his ear, he started hearing rumbling in his head, like a thunderstorm was unleashing in itself inside of him. That's when he lost it. He wet his pants. As the hot liquid left his body and soaked his jeans, he began to cry. He was babbling too. He didn't know what he was saying. He was talking gibberish. He was in a world of misery beyond anything he'd experienced before, and that was saying a lot. Wrapping his arms around himself, he began to rock and hum. He didn't know how long he rocked and hummed, but when Hudson stopped, the mouths were gone, completely gone, like they'd never, been, they, like they'd never ever been there. He looked around, then looked up at the blanket. It was hanging in place, and it was thick enough to cover the opening so he couldn't tell if the vent cover was there. He started to stand so he could move the desk and check the vent cover, but that was when he noticed the sticky burning wetness in his pants. Oh man, he had to get cleaned up. He wasn't going to sit in his own pee the rest of the night. Hudson picked up the butcher knife and the rolling pin, pausing the, to listen at the door. Hudson slowly opened it. Hearing nothing, he stepped into the hall and he tripped and fell toward the floor. No, he was grabbed. He was grabbed by the wrist and flung as if he was half his size. The wrenching motion of the grab and fling broke the same wrist Lewis had broken when Hudson was a boy. Or was he still a boy? 
Hadn't he felt he just felt Lewis's clammy palm against his skin? Yes, he'd seen the green shag carpet in the hallway of his house flash past his gaze as he flew through the air. You peed your pants, crybaby, Lewis boomed. Pathetic. Hudson moaned as he landed. He cradled his snapped wrist against his belly and he grasped in siren-like yelps as he looked around. No green shag carpet. Still the black and white squares. No wasn't, he, no sorry, he wasn't at home. He was in Frasbear's frights and he'd just been flung and he just lost his butcher knife. It was laying a few feet down the hall, still spinning, the black end pointing at him. Then the pointed end, the black end and the pointed end. Uh, again, he was alone. Well, not totally alone. All the animatronics' parts were on the on the walls were muttering. They were whispering, giggling, pointing, reaching, and worst of all, watching. He could see the eyes on the wall following his movements. Hudson gasped. Two of the reaching arms had weapons. One had his nightstick, and one had the hammer. Both arms swung their weapons back and forth. A partial foxy arm, with its pyro hook extended, was between Hudson's two weapons, but the hook was unmoving. Hudson forced himself to look away from the chaotic movement on the walls. It was making him dizzy. Or was he dizzy because of the broken wrist? 